recall of two lectures ago, that's the representation theorem in its beautiful power, because on the first line you see its expression when the source is steel can be an extended one. So you see the integral on the top. You see the slip vector distributed on a surface, but we're going to assume it's like a plane, a beautiful plane. The geometry of a source that is embedded in this unitary amplitude vector that is the normal, in the case of the plane, is just one. Then we see the material properties here. You need simple, the simplest word that we can imagine, just mu is there, when we assume a homogeneous medium and a pure shear dislocation. And then we have the medium here, because G stands for the Green's function tensor. We have learned during the last lecture that in the simplest case, the Green's function, due to a unitary force in a given place, in a given direction, that's the problem, has a radiation pattern. But due to its derivative, spatial derivative, we have to take into consideration couples. And at the end of the story, when the source is a point, we have just a double couple here. OK? That's the summary for the source. What's next? Let's be, oh my god, that's still terrible. Please remember that we have three possible representations. The physical one, maybe it's related to a fault that in the, our specific case was pointing towards the north, so strike is zero. The dip was so strange that it was zero in the specific case. And then we had a slip in this direction. OK. So that's the fault plane, the mechanism, the slip vector, the normal vector in our specific case. We can represent it as a double couple, 1, 3, 3, 1, if you remember. OK? It's a representation. But of course, corresponds to a moment tensor. A very simple one. If you diagonalize the moment tensor, then it will appear in this way. As usual, the trace has to be null, zero, and one of the eigenvalues has to be zero. So a representation with the moment tensor. Then we can imagine to use the eigenvectors related to these eigenvalues, and we have the tension, the pressure, and the null axis that is coming out from the screen. A third possible representation. OK. Then, during the beautiful last lecture, we have learned that the displacement due to a double couple into a homogeneous medium is made by P and S waves. Yes, we were waiting for that. But please remember that we have a P wave arriving there, an S wave arriving there, a radiation pattern that is that has four lobes when we consider a double couple. So when we consider just, um, I've seen if you, I was using it today in the library, if you look for Jose Pujol textbook, uh, is a nice one, it's a very nice one. Uh, I think you have also the electronic version, there is just one copy in the library, but there are some nice plots of the radiation pattern. Due to a single force and also due to a double couple. We will see them today. So we have a radiation pattern. We have a P wave. We have an S wave. We have some information about the nature of the waves, because these are spherical waves. They decay going with one over distance, as we are waiting for. Then, due to the spatial derivative and due to an algebraic gain, here what's going to be propagated is just one piece of timing information. Because when we consider a point source, all the kinematics are squeezed into a point, and the only kinematic time that is left is sleep time. What's going to be propagated will be the time derivative. So if we imagine a ramp function, what's going to be propagated, it will be a box car with the duration of the sleep. So to sum up, if we go so far from the source that it is a point, 
so far from the point that we can forget the beautiful near field that is leaving a static displacement. Remember co-seismic. Remember when you will start the course with Alessandro Borghi. You're going to study this one. But for today, we will stay far source, far field. The simplest configuration that we can imagine. OK? Let's be simple. OK. So let's try to use what we have learned, and let's try to depict in a nice way the radiation part. So now we have an antenna that, according to its spatial configuration, will radiate differently into the space. What we are going to use just today will be the radiation due to the first arrivals, so P wave. And we will learn that some of them will be positive, pushing the receiver. Some of them will be negative, pulling the receiver. You can imagine that a push for, a, for the receiver will be a tension for the source, and vice versa. OK. Summary number two. This is what we're going to use. That's the piece of theory that we need for today. So, up to now, we have just summarized what we have learned with pain in the last lectures, representation theorem, rings function. Far field, far source. Far source means that we have just moment tensor, combo with the spatial derivative of the Green's function. Far field means, okay, that's, this is what we are waiting for. Now, looking at that expression, Let's try to think about it. First, look at the numbers in front of m dot. The combination of sines and cosines of the, what we will call, um, in the next slide, you will see that we are going to assume a spherical reference system centered into the source, and then we will consider a receiver. So to describe the relative position of the receiver respect to the source, we will need two angles, if you want, co-latitude, longitude, respect to the source, and the radial component. So it's like the three modes when we have discussed the three modes of the Earth. We had have, we have to use a spherical reference system. Today it's the same, but the center of our universe is not the center of the Earth, but the source. It's there. So the combination of angles will describe the radiation pattern. And as you can notice, P and S are different, as we can guess. Also due to a very simple and single force, when you push here, you are going to wait for strong P here, positive, negative, and zero. What about S? Zero here, it's shear, and maximum on the sides, okay? So those angles are picturing, in some way, the radiation pattern. Then, both of them will decay as 1 over r, because they are spherical waves. Please remember that we are using now a very strong approximation. The Earth is homogeneous. Please remember that in more realistic models, we will have reflections, refractions, the free surface, P, SB, SH, Rayleigh, Love. For today, we will see it in a very simple configuration, OK? And then the last numbers. Look here. Due to the normalization property of the, uh, how to say, volume integrals, what is left here is 1 over velocity cube, 1 over velocity cube. Now, if you do remember P and S wave velocities, you should remember that P is named as P, coming from latin prime, that means first, because they are the fastest. So alpha usually is, uh, well, alpha is larger than beta. For a Poissonian media, let's go back to wave physics, when lambda is equal to mu, alpha will be the square root of 3 times beta. What does it mean? That on average, S waves will be larger, because this is smaller than this. 
okay? So P will be faster, but S will be larger on average. Then, as I was telling you, when we squeeze all the information in a point, okay, we can say, wow, it's nice, but please remember that we lose something. Time information, because what is left there is just the sleep. So if a sleep is an unrealistic step function, what's going to be propagated will be its time derivative, that means a delta. More, sorry, more realistically, it will take some time for the sleep to occur. So the simplest, more realistic model will be a ramp. What's going to be propagated will be a box car with the duration of the terrain. We're going to call that rise time. And it's the only time that is left there. Please, do remember that we have left an important piece of information, the rupture time. Rupture starting, propagating, stopping. Usually that's a long one. You have seen, for the case of Toku, between two and three minutes. While this one, usually, it's of the order of seconds. So please remember this, because on Friday we will um, get back to that and we will learn how rupture time will be important. Okay, what we're going to use today is this piece of information. Just to relax you, this picture is coming from the textbook. So the full part of, the, of this theory is contained there. And that's for P radiation pattern. That's the reference system that we can use. The center is in the source. Then we have a receiver. According to the relative position of the receiver respect to the source, it's going to feel something. Collatitude and longitude and radial, but just refer to the source. It's not the center of the Earth. Now, if you develop this radiation pattern in terms of theta and phi, two angles, you will see that these four lobes will appear. So it's really an antenna. And according to where you are sit, respect to the source, you can feel a strong P plus a strong P minus. So it's going to push and to pull there. And zero here. Actually, those planes, this one and this one, are Nodal planes. On those planes, there is no motion, no P motion. Okay? So you're going to listen plus, you're going to listen minus, you're going to listen nothing in some places. So you can imagine these four lobes. It's in 3D. That's why I suggested you to use, um, at a given point of this presentation, there is a link, it's working, I was testing, to uh, okay, I, I'm not trying to here to uh, make any advertisement, but it's free software coming from Mathematica, and this is, uh, you can download the CDF player, and that's the radiation pattern, okay? You see how it can be oriented in the space. This is changing the strike of a fault. Please, give a look to, back to this. You see, that's the fault play. You remember our strange fault? The double couple, well, okay, you're going to have a strong plus, strong minus, strong minus, strong plus. And nothing on the fault and nothing on the other plane. Well, in the direct world, we know which one is the fault and which one is called the auxiliary plane. In reality, we cannot distinguish that because we have a symmetry, the symmetry of the moment tensor. So in practice, we will never know which one is the fault plane and which one is the auxiliary plane. Well, maybe you can knock on geology's door and say, can you tell me some, can you give us some suggestions about which one? Well, the geologist, maybe with some field work or with other geological information, will tell, no, no, come on, the faults are oriented in this way. So that's the fault plane and that's the auxiliary. Otherwise, from the point of view of Seismological radiation, we cannot distinguish that. In the direct, yes, we know. In the inverse, we cannot. Okay? So that's the plane that's going to be described by strike, dip, and rake is telling us the direction of the motion. 
actually when you turn them here you can play with dip and with rake the slip angle you see it's a different way to put into the space this four lobes or radiation pattern and that's the piece of information that we're going to use today to draw the beach balls that's the piece of information that we need that's the beach ball it's ready for the other piece of information one word here that is nice because it's time one session where they were putting this information in the same slide please also do remember the time piece of time of information here of course for the waves to arrive to our point we need to wait how much well it depends on our distance of course that's the retarded time we have to wait for us we have to wait longer because alpha is larger than beta the time information that's going to be propagated is the derivative and well in m what is time dependent huh. in this writing here we have two time dependency as it should be one is the time necessary for the rupture to occur on the on the area but now we're going to lose it the other one is the time derivative of a slip history as I was showing to you in the previous slide. Now this is for P. So please remember these four lobes here with plus and minus. What about S? Same configuration here, but now we have to remember the nature of S waves. Let's try to go back to wave physics exam and we do remember that P waves are compressions and reflections. You have the version, the complex version of sound waves in solids. Okay? So they are longitudinal. So if the direction of propagation is x, they are going to create perturbations along x. What about S waves? Well, we remember that they are transverse. Now, if we have one direction of propagation, they will stay in a plane perpendicular, and they are shear waves. Later, in the course of wave physics, we decompose them into SB and SH. You do remember. And, okay, V and H stands for vertical and horizontal. Actually, H is proper because according to, to the direction of propagation into a reference surface, that usually is the free surface, H stands for the component that is parallel to the free surface. V will accommodate the other part of the motion. If no free surface, S waves are just transverse, but they have two components. That's why here, you see, we separate the S wave field into theta and phi. Now, if you imagine to be seated here and you imagine a plane arriving at the receiver here, you will have two components, like in the free modes lecture that we called at that time, if you remember, Toshua and spheroidal. Spheroidal were containing the radial, the vertical in that case, and another horizontal component. The torsional, just Y. I hope you do remember that there was a tiny component also in the other direction. Okay, so S waves in this system here need to have two components because they are transverse pairs. So you can imagine here to have a plane at the receiver position and to have a component that is going in this direction and one in this direction, z and phi. We cannot yet call them as being the same because we have no surface. This radiation is occurring in, in an infinite homogeneous isotropic world. That's why since we have two components, the radiation pattern here has no nodal planes, has nodal points. So it's more complicated because we have two components of motion. So P is easier because it's pointing like that. S is more complicated because they are transverse. On average, they are larger. Why? Because here we are divided by beta and not by alpha. So what we have learned up to now is that we have two different radiation patterns for P and S. 
P is easier, it's four loads. S is a little bit different. I will show it to you now. They are 3D radiation patterns, and they are changing the position, remembering strike, dip, and rake. So we have squeezed everything in a point, but now the source is simple, is a point, and now it's represented by an antenna moving into the space, remembering strike, dip, and rake. So we are 3D radiation patterns, and on average, the S wave field is larger than the P one. But P is simpler, because, OK, if you are waiting, we will be pushed up or down. And this is the piece of information that we are going to use today. Just to show in 3D this vision, well, OK, that's another picture coming from a recession with arrows, still not 3D. I will show to you now. So let's remember what we did. We considered a strange fault, like that. We placed a double couple, 1331. Now we have a radiation of a double couple. For P, if you look at it from the side, so from your point of view, that's the fault, that's the double couple here. OK, we will see these four lobes. If you want this image here is using this one and putting the this representation like that and you're looking from the side. Okay? So it's just the dependency on theta. And that's it. Okay? So you see these four lobes from the from your point of view. Okay? In terms of arrows in terms of vectors, because let's remember that displacement is a vector, you will see up, up, down. That's for P. Now, if you look from the side, also S will be simpler, just from the side. From the side. So we are just looking at the dependencies on theta, because we have decided to stay in phi equals zero in this reference here. So actually, what we are looking here now, let me show to you, is this sine of 2 theta, and from the side, this cosine of 2 theta. So you see, in this case, how they are complementary. So they are shifted. If we decide to stay on a phi equals 0, we have four lobes for P, four lobes for S. But just when you move the source and you look at it from, from your point of view, phi equals 0. So sine, cosine, and different arrows with different pieces of information. Just to remember to you that the radiation pattern is a 3D animal, I use this picture here. And it's not for our fault, because you see it's a 45 dipping. So it's not like that, it's like that. But just to show to you how complementary they are, look at P, look at S, look at the positive, negative, and how larger is the radiation pattern when compared to P. Okay? Uh, just to show to you in 3D, everything is working. That's for P, that's for S. And you can, of course, rotate it. Strike, dip, and rake. When you change these three angles, you're changing the fault. So you're moving in different position of the radiation path. OK. Just a different vision. And just to let you to remember, it's it just the same concept with slides that are expressing again this. I like this one because it's making us to remember that there was a fault. A long time ago, we studied the fault. So that's the fault plane, a slip vector. Please do remember that everything is decided here. The reference system and the radiation pattern as seen from the side. Now, you can imagine now, if you consider just P waves, that the world is divided into four quadrants. In one part, in one piece of the world, you're going to feel a push for the receiver, that is a pull for the source. 
On the other side of the world, you're going to feel a strong pull, but it will be a push from the source. Two nodal planes, and then vice versa. So you can imagine this, actually it's called focal sphere. So you can imagine to draw a sphere, it's an imaginary sphere, around the point where now we have located the source. And the world is divided in quadrants. That's the information that we want to use. Is it okay, the logic? Because if it is okay, actually, Sorry. yes. Now, this is the radiation pattern that you can draw around the source, okay? So it's a plus. Plus means, okay, we are going away from the source. For the source, it's a pool. Yeah. Now, let's imagine to be seated here. The pool of the source will be a push for you, okay? This is what I'm saying. So the vector is pointing there. But they should be symmetrical there on the image on the left. They are to be symmetrical here. Plus, plus. Okay. Uh, that's a minus. So it should be equal to the plus plus. Uh, um, I think it's a matter of um, vision, illusion in, in vision. Because I guess, if you're right, um, the amplitude should be the same. I guess that the, the length of this arrow here is the same as this one. Okay. I see. Uh, I see. But the effect, the visual effect is making this to appear smaller. Yeah. But I guess it's the same length. And it's going to zero here. Here it's going to zero. So it's an illusion. If they appear shorter, maybe they are shorter, but in principle, you're right, they should be equal. Okay? In the same here. So also, this is a sort of a messy thing here. What you have to remember is that here, just on this side, the arrow is going in this direction, and the arrow is going in this direction. It's, it's a shear. So it's not a push and pull, it's a shear. So this is moving in this direction, but it's moving in the other direction. Remember P, pressures or dilatations, and shear waves, okay? Uh, and I placed again this picture just to make a sort of a panoramic view of the different textbooks that they are fronting. This is coming from the old version of the Akin. Still the same concept. Why I like it? Because there is the radiation pattern here, and there is this imaginary sphere around the fault, but there was a fault there. Now there is a point, and we can represent it with a double couple, or with axis, T, P, B. Remember, all of them are the same representations. Double couple, moment tensor, axis. Okay? The main message here is that according on how you rotate it, strike different rake, the different parts of the world will feel different, will have different feelings. And that's the next trick that we have to play. Now let's imagine that the Earth is covered by a uniform and beautiful seismic network. And we have telephones. Okay? So an earthquake is occurring. We know what it is. It's an assumption. And, okay, let's call. So I'm calling you, and I'm asking you, is it a plus or a minus for you? And you say, it's plus. Okay, good. Then I phone you, then I phone you. Some of you, maybe, it's nothing occurred here, because we are on the nodal plane. It's an extreme version. And you told me, no, it's minus. So collecting this piece of information around, Let's imagine now to take it down to the source. And we want to draw that sphere with plus and minus. Then, okay, we take it and we project it. We cut it in half, we make a stereographic projection, and we look it from the top. Okay, that's the focal mechanism. It's just a graphical representation of plus and minus. So this is what we have to discuss for one hour more. But that's the game. Collect the information, trace it back, build that sphere, 
project it, cutting in half, we project it, and we look from the top. That's the focal mechanism. This is what we're going to do now. Now, to make your life, okay, that's P and that's S. Okay? And this is what we're going to do, to build the seismic beach walls. Now you could say, but come on, now, with piece of, this piece of information, why there was people before the representation theorem thinking that the best equivalent force to a point source as a shear dislocation is a double couple or a couple? There was the debate, I told you. Some people were thinking, no, it's better to use a couple, no, it's a double couple. Well, you have to know that the P wave radiation pattern is the same for a force, for a couple, and a double couple. With different orientation, but it's the same. S wave is different. And before the 60s, actually, the seismic networks were very few. Computers, they were very few. And to process S waves with pure shear and not was not easy. So actually, what we are going to do now, it seems trivial, but it was not trivial before computers and seismic networks. So that's why, please remember, uh, representation theorem is, it was coming in the 60s, but before the 60s, just few instruments and just few computers. So, okay, it's trivial what we are going to discuss now. It was not that trivial at that time. Okay, this is what we have to do. We have to decide a representation of that sphere. And what we're going to use technically, it's not my cup of tea, but we're going to use a stereographic representation. Now, what's the idea? Now, let's imagine to have this imaginary sphere around the fold. It's no more a fold, it's a point. Okay? Whether we can imagine a double couple, whether we can imagine TPB. It's the same. So, we're rotating it. How to represent into a 2D? Well, one possibility is to do this. So now we have to imagine this imaginary sphere. We cut it. We can imagine maybe the surface of the Earth. And we take the bottom part. OK. That's the fold with its strike, with its dip. Now we can imagine that from the side, this will be the projection, the fold. That's the dip, and that will be the strike. If you imagine to view it from above, you take this sphere and you look it from the top, okay, that fold will become a line. So a plane will become a line in this projection. And that's it. That's the game. You could say, oh, yes, but we're losing information. It's a 3D, yes, we cut it, and we have to decide to take the upper or the lower. Let's take the lower, and we can imagine to see it from the side. No, let's look it from the top. So it's a series of decisions to be taken. So we cut, we take the lower, and we look from the top. That's the representation of a fold. Now a plane, 2D, is becoming a line, 1D. You can imagine that a vector, for example, a ray that is leaving from the source, it's a line in, a, how to say, in a 3D medium, it will become a point. So we're losing one dimension to get a picture simpler. Remember that we're taking some decisions. Now, to make our life easier, and just to show to you that there are many ways to use a projection. Uh, don't ask me. The other ones, I'm not working in geodesy, maybe with Alessandro, you will do something else. That's the one that we're going to adopt. It's not equal area. So what is an area before in this projection will not be the same. But it, you, it preserves angles. That's why stereographic projection is used. And we want to look at angles, not at areas. Now, 
Let's do together a piece of your homework. I hope it's still here. Mm. No, that's a paper. Yes. <coughs> if you, I hope it is working, I don't know if it's going to work now. If you look on your portal, um, behind today's lecture, there are three uh, external links. It's your homework to read or give a look to them. Let's do together a piece of the first. It's the nicest homework that you can imagine. It's a movie made by USGS and Iris, and it's explaining what is a focal mechanism. That is today's topic. And there is some audio, but ah, I don't want to. Maybe. I don't remember if there is something here. So today we're going to make it very fast. Mm. Let's see if something is coming out here. But please, no, let's be the adapter. Where's the other one? Go to the computer. Maybe I'm going to break everything here. Okay. Let's see if it is working. Let's pause it. <laughs> 